So see, he has been cited in academic journals more than 4,000 times and in newspapers more than 11,000 times. And so is, is therefore one of the most influential professors of education um, in the world. And so we're very delighted to hear from Dr. Sean Harper from the University of Pennsylvania. So what Tony didn't tell you is that those 11,000 newspaper mentions were all bad press, tabloids. <laughs> it is such a pleasure to have this opportunity to talk with you about my work on student success. Um, it is a topic of study for me. Higher education is, in fact, my field of study. So I teach graduate students at the University of Pennsylvania who are preparing to become vice chancellors and uh, student affairs professionals and provosts and other senior higher education leaders. So I talk with them often about student success. So as you might imagine, given that I study this and publish books about it and lots of papers, I could talk to you all afternoon about this topic. But I've only been given 20 minutes. So uh, my friend Bill Moses uh, said to you this morning in his opening remarks that he wanted you to imagine if you had just one rand, what would you do with it? So the way I'm thinking about this is that I have the equivalent of three rand. Uh, and I'm going to spend six minutes uh, per rand uh, talking with you about, about my work on how we succeed. So I was really struck when I got the invitation uh, to come and speak with you by uh, the title of the conference and its interpretation, We Succeed. So I want to talk with you about three ways in which we succeed. Now, to be sure, I am not suggesting that these are the only three ways or that, you know, there's sort of uh, some magic that happens here. If you just do these three things, every student will be successful. But I had to think uh, quite carefully about how to spend my three rand so I thought, if I could just give you three things that I've learned about how students succeed in college, what would those three be? So one of those things is that we have to consider all factors. What I mean by that is that I so appreciate that throughout this conference, we've been talking about data analytics and about using data uh, to both measure and improve student success and student outcomes and performance. Uh, but I want us to also consider all factors when we're talking about data and analytics. Not just the convenient factors, not just the factors that higher education researchers and practitioners and leaders uh, go to all the time. Uh, let me sort of unpack that a bit and, and talk a bit about my work. The image that you see here on the screen is an image of students in the U.S. protesting. You know quite a bit about student unrest here in South African universities. Now, there were uprisings on college and university campuses in the U.S. Uh, throughout the fall and spring of this past academic school year. Now, they were not protesting fees, but they were, in fact, protesting racism. And racist experiences that many of them had had in predominantly white college and university context. And uh, more poignantly, they were protesting the lack of institutional response to students' experiences and encounters with racism. Um, now, I want us to consider that as a factor in student success. I direct the Center for the Study of Race and Equity in Education at the University of Pennsylvania, and we mostly focus on student success and, uh, and campus climate. What I mean by campus climate is that usually presidents and vice chancellors and deans will hire our center for three to four days to come on their campuses and do focus groups with up to about 300 students in which we're trying to get a sense of which students are likeliest to feel a strong sense of belonging versus those who feel a sense of exclusion. We try to get a sense of uh, students' appraisals of institutional responses 
to racial incidents that have happened on campus, as well as student complaints and reflections on encounters that they've had with racial problems. We also try to get a sense uh, in these focus groups of the degree to which students interact cross-racially and so on. So we've now done these campus climate studies at about 36 universities across the United States. And so that means we've interviewed about 10,000 undergraduates in focus groups. Now, some of what we hear in our focus groups with those students make very clear to us why they aren't succeeding. And they have nothing to do with under preparation, right? So what I'm encouraging us to do here is to move beyond just a narrow set of, of variables and a narrow set of factors. Let me tell you a really quick story. So I was on a campus recently doing a study, and this was a campus that was located in an urban setting in the U.S., Chicago. Um, and it's a commuter institution, meaning that they don't have residence halls, so all of the students commute. So this particular institution invited our center to come and study their problem with black student success. Now, they understood their problem to be that only 7.6% of black students graduated within six years. 7.6% completed within six years, which is horrifying, right? No matter if we're talking in a U.S. university or in a South African university or anywhere else, nearly 93% of students not completing is, is, is alarming. Now, what I'm doing in the paper that I'm writing from the data that we collected for this study is that I am writing a section that is titled Black Students Versus White Statistics. <laughs> what I do in that section is unpack the factors that students laid out and explained to us that undermined their success. For example, they had no black professors, right? They also experienced extreme amounts of racism in their campuses and in their classrooms. We also discovered that black students in comparison to students from other racial and ethnic groups had a much further commute to the campus because the university only recruited in a very narrow section of the city. So because of their long commutes and because of Chicago, if there was a snowstorm, and there's snowstorms there often, right? You know, students' commutes would be delayed and they wouldn't make it to class. So they would say, well, yeah, we have a higher rate of absenteeism from class. It's not because we don't want to be there. It's because we can't get there. These kinds of factors, right? Black student explanations for their lack of success versus, again, what I call white statistics would have us only focus on things like preparation and finances and engagement and effort, right? So again, how we succeed is by taking into account all of the factors. Right? Um, I thought this morning that uh, the student on the panel did such a remarkable job of pressing us to understand the complexities of students' lives and experiences and the threats to their success. When she told that story about living in a one room with seven other college students. That is a threat to success that doesn't show up in our normal data analytics. Therefore, we have to engage and talk with students, both in quantitative ways through, you know, surveys and other data analytics, but we also have to engage them qualitatively to understand their needs, their realities, and again, the threats to success. That is how we succeed. We also succeed 
by learning from success. Now, I'm so thrilled to be here with our colleagues from Georgia State University. Uh, they're in Atlanta. I grew up four hours south of there in a small town, Thomasville, Georgia. So they're in the city. I'm from a place that we call the country, a place where country music is really popular. <laughs> now, there is a really popular country music song, in fact, uh, from the 1980s. Uh, that talks about looking for love in all the wrong places. I argue that we look for student success in all the wrong places. One of the things that I've been continually perplexed and disturbed by throughout my career is how conversations on student success almost always are about how and why students are not succeeding. In other words, our attention it's almost always about looking at data to try to understand why students who are at the bottom of statistical metrics of educational performance and progress are there or are there and doing so so poorly, right? In the United States, black men are there. If we look at, again, just about any statistical metric of educational success, we will see black undergraduate men at the very bottom. I am not suggesting that we shouldn't care about what's happening at the bottom. What I'm suggesting on the other hand though is that that's where all of our attention is often placed. Let me see if I can put this differently. For 15 years now in my research, I have consistently argued that if we want to do something to improve the rates of success for black men, we probably should spend at least a portion of our efforts studying black men who have been successful and understanding the conditions, the practices, the programs, and the policies that have enabled them to succeed. The image that you see on the screen, right, is this one lone black male graduate with all these empty chairs around him, right? So usually the conversation is about why aren't there more black men at this graduation? My question is, what about him? What can he teach us? What can we learn from him that might enable us to get more black undergraduate men to and through higher education? Now, this hasn't been just a philosophical question for me. It's been a question that I've explored in my research for instance, uh, colleagues and I at the center did a major study in 40 public high schools across New York City in which we were studying black and Latino male high school juniors and seniors who were college bound, college ready, definitely going to college. Um, 325 of them across these 40 high schools. We went and did individual face-to-face -face interviews with. Now this was important to us because there is a narrative about urban high schools that nothing good happens there. And especially for young men of color, nobody from there goes to college, right? If you ever saw a movie or a television show that was situated in an urban high school in the US, you just see like these apathetic, like black boys who are going nowhere fast. But yet we knew that there were young men in these schools who were succeeding. So we went, we sought them out. We learn from them about how they manage to succeed and develop college aspirations and so on. We also interviewed 90 young men who were from those same 40 high schools but were enrolled in 44 uh, colleges and universities because as has been pointed out here at the conference so far, that simply getting students to university is only half of the, of the initiative here. Ensuring that they are prepared to succeed once they get there is the other part of it, right? So we wanted to understand how students who were successful in high school were experiencing college. Let me just say really quickly here that that high school study built on a national black male college achievement study that I had previously done that took me to 42 colleges and universities in 20 different states across the US, in which I sought out 219 
black undergraduate men who had extraordinarily high grade point averages. They were also incredibly engaged, both inside and outside the classroom. In fact, these were guys who uh, held multiple leadership positions on campus. They were in a variety of clubs and organizations, and they did things that we call enriching educational experiences, like study abroad, summer internships, research with faculty, right? Anybody who had read anything about young men, young black men in college, would presume that there were no such guys who were succeeding at such high rates. Because again, all we hear about them is bad news. I would imagine that there are students in your universities for whom you only hear bad news, bad statistics, bad data, right? Hopeless narratives. But yet, these 219 men, I interviewed them individually for two to three hours each on their campuses to understand how they were succeeding. So I developed for this particular project what I call an anti-deficit achievement framework. It is a framework that takes commonly asked questions about black male student success and flips them inside out. Right? Let me give you some examples. So one common example is, or one common question rather, is why are black male undergraduates so disengaged in campus leadership positions and out of class activities? <laughs> Important question that at this point has been beat to death in the literature and in practice. I instead ask the question, what compels black undergraduate men to pursue leadership and engagement opportunities on their campuses. Might we learn something about the impetus for engagement that will, that will be instructive for getting more of these young men engaged? Let me give you another one. Why are black male students' grade point averages often the lowest among both sexes and all racial and ethnic groups on many campuses? I instead was interested in understanding what resources are most effective in helping black male achievers earn grade point averages above 3.0 in a variety of majors, including STEM fields. About a quarter of the 219 participants in this national study were in STEM fields. There were black men actually succeeding in STEM fields. Shouldn't we know how they do that so we can help not only more black men, but more underrepresented students in STEM fields succeed? Just for fun, let me give you just one more. Uh, why are black men's relationships with faculty and administrators so weak? Commonly asked question. I was instead interested in understanding how do black men go about cultivating meaningful, value-added relationships with key institutional agents? One thing that I discovered is that institutional agents were often proactive in establishing relationships with these young men, which is not something that, again, we would have discovered if we had only stayed in the deficit space. So in short here, what I'm suggesting is that as we engage in our data analytics work, might we also engage students who have succeeded I am guessing that you actually have students who graduated from your universities. <laughs> who were the first in their families to go to college. Who also came from low-income families. And from a variety of really tough circumstances. Should we not try to better understand, again, the conditions, the practices, the policies, the educational approaches, and so on that help those students succeed so that we can learn and reshape our approaches to help others, right? Okay, I only have one rand left. Um, so let me just talk for a moment about designing for success. How we succeed is by designing for success. A couple years ago, uh, like five years ago now, um, I received a grant from Lumina Foundation um, in the US to uh, do a project that I called the Institutional Change for Black Male Student Success 
project. Now, this project was about going beyond sort of individual sort of understandings of achievement and actually helping institutions assume institutional responsibility for student success. So I had the pleasure over a three-year period to work with five colleges and universities across the U.S. Each institution chose one specific opportunity to improve black male student success. Notice I didn't call it a problem. I called it an opportunity, right? Because we have to get beyond these prisms of problems and think about what might we do, what might be our opportunity here, right? If we do our work from, a more, from an opportunistic place, I can assure you it's much more satisfying and exciting, right? So each institution chose one problem that was plaguing their particular campus, turn it into an opportunity to do something to advance black male student success. Um, they worked in teams. These were cross-sectional teams that were comprised of cabinet level administrators. So at least one person on the team had to be someone who was at the power epicenter of the institution who sat at the table with the president and with other vice presidents and deans and others. The team also had to include at least two tenured faculty members. Again, professors who were located at the power epicenter and at least two undergraduate students because well-intentioned administrators and institutional agents go out and try to do things for student success and they often fail because they have no student input. And you know, students on the team told us that, yeah, we could have told you that that wouldn't work uh, all along if somebody had just asked us in the beginning. So what we decided is that there had to be at least two undergraduates on the team. And then there were five others. So each campus had a team of 10. We brought those uh, five teams to Philadelphia, to the University of Pennsylvania campus for four days. And I shared with them all that I learned in this National Black Male College Achievement Study that I can't share with you because we only have like, I don't know, like a minute left. Um, <laughs> so I shared with them the best of what I learned about how black male students succeed. But I also shared with them a set of standards that a colleague at the University of Arkansas and I had developed for black male student initiatives. So each campus designed an opportunity to improve black male student success. They literally designed for success using insights from successful students and using standards that have been created to guide their work. In the interest of time, I'll just tell you about one of the five institutions. It's North Carolina Central University which is a historically black university, um, or as Mashudu uh, said this morning, it is a historically um, disadvantaged university, as a matter of fact. The opportunity that North Carolina Central chose to take on was its six-year black male graduation rate, which at the time was 27%. So in other words, 27% of black undergraduate men who started at this particular university graduated within, within six years. They seized that as their opportunity. Now, they used their data analytics to better understand which black male students were least likely to graduate within six years. Their data very clearly showed them, this will be unsurprising to you, I'm sure, that students who were admitted to the Honors College on the, on the campus were most likely to graduate within six years. Students who were admitted with 2.75 and below high school grade point averages, so C or lower high school grade point averages, were least likely to graduate within six years. So they chose to focus their opportunity on the young men who were admitted to the university with 2.75 high school GPAs and below. This particular initiative was started during the centennial year of the university. 
So as a part of their design, they called these students Centennial Scholars. Now these were young men who historically had not been successful in schools before they got to college, right? They just barely got to college, as a matter of fact. But suddenly, someone was calling them scholars. So when we went for site visits year after year after year, across the three years, we heard these young men talk about just how life-changing it was for someone to see them as a scholar and to treat them as such. So what the institution did in its design is that they merely adapted the design that many U.S. universities use for honor students, learning communities, centralized support services, having students uh, move through as a cohort, having them show up to campus a few weeks before the first year um, started, right? Those things that we know work for honor students, they did that for these students. Now, I'll fast forward to the end here uh, so I can hand it over um, to, to uh, Eunice here and just say to you that across three cohorts of students, only three, three black undergraduate men did not persist at North Carolina Central. This was at a place that started with a 27% six-year graduation rate, right? I should tell you that the size of these cohorts were around 30, 35 students uh, per, co per cohort. That suggests to me that something can be done about student success. If we design for it, if we learn from that design, and then bring that design to scale, and take the best of what we learn from all of our data sources, from all of our data analytics, qualitative, quantitative, and otherwise, and design from a place of hope, from a place of strategy and intentionality, and from a place of belief that we can succeed. Okay, I'll stop here and... Very motivational. <laughs> so maybe we'll take the questions in at the end, whilst people are thinking about this. Uh, I'm going to start out. I, I as, as was mentioned, I'm busy setting up Salt Lake University. We're now in the third year of our teaching activities. We started with 124 students in uh, 2014. There's now 710 about. Um, as we expected, we didn't enroll any middle class students to start with. Um, if you've got money and your children do well at school, you're not likely to send your child to an unknown university. So, as, as we expected, our, our students are predominantly um, colored and African, which is more a class statement than a race statement. Uh, almost entirely township schools, rural schools, and very rarely do one of them get an A or a B in matric. Uh, so the sort of students who would be classified almost immediately by all the metrics at, uh, at our established universities as students at risk. Um, of course, uh, quite remarkably, and I, I'm still frightened by the statistic because I, I hope I can, we can sustain it, um, our average course pass rates have been in the order of 90%. Uh, and last year, 75% of students passed all their courses. Um, now, of course, uh, I should add, quality management is being done outside of the university. So uh, academics from universities of the free state come and tell us we're doing okay and monitor exams and students and so on. Uh, CPUT very kindly has been helping us with the diploma programs. And then Professor Colin Wright looks after our IT and science programs. Uh, he used to be dean of, uh, of science at, uh, at WITS. So we, we've been very careful to keep outside oversight on what we're doing. Um, of course, small classes help. I mean, we've got our, our, stu our South student ratios are about uh, 14 or 15 uh, students to an academic. But if that was the only answer, then we don't need these conferences. Uh, then we go to the minister and say, listen, just give us more academic staff. 
You don't need de- teaching development grants, etc. So, firstly, I want to say I don't believe that it's only t- uh, uh, small classes. Uh, the, 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 the nature of the students that we've been taking have been, have been worrying to start with. They make the minimum admission requirements. Our admission requirements are no different from uh, most universities in this country. But they, um, uh, they, they somehow rise to the challenge. Uh, and at this moment, I would have needed my first slide, but it's not on. So uh, somewhere there's something happening. <laughs> So what I'm going to do in things what, that most of us know about the nature of the students we take who come from what we call disadvantaged communities. Um, I, we, we've, we've analyzed that and probably most of us would know the answers without me talking to them. I'd rather, I'd rather want to spend more time on, rather than the problem with them, the problem with us. Uh, what is it we're not doing right? Um, the, because I do think the enemy is with it. Uh, and we need to engage with it. We need to understand it and then respond. So what I'm going to do is give you a few... Uh, um <laughs> Password lock. What I was saying is, these are the sorts of things that, that I don't think we need to, enge- to spend too much time on. But one of the things we do at Salt Lake University is make sure that every student eats. Um, let me say our students uh, find the fees must fall debate a little bit silly. Uh, you're giving them a 10% discount. They can't afford the first 10%. Um, so it's not, it's not really an issue. If we don't raise funding, they can't study. Uh, that's it. Uh, the, the, it's as simple as that. Um, they, they, we d- deal with eating. We IT most of our students have never switched on a computer, but they actually respond quite easily. Um, by the fourth week of term, we monitor these things. They sort of set up a Facebook page for sharing homework ideas, um, so they actually respond quite quickly. It's not a serious, um, a serious issue for them. Uh, the one thing that maybe we don't pay too much attention to is community alienation. You know, in the middle classes, when you, when you, when you, when you, as you progress in university, you get greater access into your community. When you come from the sort of communities that our students come from, you get greater alienation from your community. So you end up alienated at home and alienated at the university, and you live in that um, the border town of despair almost. Um, and so it's something that we don't always pay attention to, but we should. Um, don't take for granted that first year students know how to budget. You, uh, a bursary is more money than the family has ever seen at one time. Uh, so be careful, they don't, they really, they, they do very sensible things with it, they send it home. Because uh, there's no food at home. So of course, you know, why do I need to eat three meals when they're starving at home, etc. So just be careful with these sorts of things. Important also is be aware that all our students, like all students, like all young people, will arrive on campus with a series of prejudices that they learn from home uh, or their communities about anything you can think of. Uh, black people, white people, women, Catholics, Protestants, whoever you choose. What we, of course, don't want our students to do, we, d- we certainly don't want the Catholics to leave as Protestants or the Jews to... <laughs> or, the, or, or, or the Jews to leave as Muslims. What we do want is to make sure that they learn how to see the world through the eyes of the other. Because that's what civilized graduates do. That's what it means to be a graduate, is to be able to learn that. And I think be aware of that. Be aware also that our students arrive with quite serious social distortions. So our students take our campus very seriously. I didn't realize this. So if they happen to find a, 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 a robber on campus who was about to steal something, and they beat the fellow up quite badly. And you know, I just said, no, you can't do that. No, prof, that's how we deal with them in the township, uh, you know, and, 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 and <laughs> but you shouldn't. So, uh, I mean, another thing, as many vice chancellors have reported, we've been engaging with parents on occasion, say, you know, st- state of protests and, and issues, and not, not a handful of, uh, or more than a handful of parents have written in to say, just tell us who's the troublemakers, we'll come and sort them out. <laughs> Don't hit our students, please. Uh, so, but these are common issues, and I think the, the universities need to be sensitive to this 
What I want to spend a little more time on is talking about how we actually plan curricula. And very often, we, we're completely incoherent in the way we think about curriculum. It's possible, very, very rarely do we think about developing a curriculum or the pedagogy that will support that curriculum by asking, well, what does our admissions policy look like? Um, should the admissions policy not be thinking about how we structure curriculum? Curriculum is not a static thing, and there's no such a thing as the universal standard. But the way in which we structure the pedagogy that supports that curriculum needs to be coherent. We need to understand and have at least a shared view of what we mean by uh, exit standards. Let me say, the problem of teaching and learning is not new, and it's not because black students arrived at our universities or because poor students arrived. Uh, South African higher education has been poorly performing in graduation rates for when it was predominantly white universities. Um, so, so bad habits and bad teaching habits, bad curriculum habits have become the norm and we actually think that this is how it should be. In other words, it's a moment to start thinking that the normal is not normal and we have to do something about it. I'm a supporter of the, the, the co coherence approach uh, competency approach to curriculum development. Um, this is an example of a civil engineering curriculum. Down the, the left-hand column are all the courses that make up the program. Across the top are the competencies that we want to develop in our students. So in other words, liberating ourselves from this idea of, of content as being a driver of, of curriculum. I have, a, I have a, a, an abiding concern. Academics in South African universities teach too much. Everybody who's got a new idea wants to run a course on their own. I, it took me, I was unsuccessful in this at WITS. There were three courses teaching finite element analysis at the postgraduate level. And they, they were each teaching 10 students, but they wouldn't think of a single course. And finite elements, element analysis is a technique, it's not a fundamental principle. Why would you? No, no, they, asked, they set the wrong tutorial examples. So we can't study. This idea of continuously loading our students with content and is imagining that we're actually doing some learning, well, it's not a surprise that our students survive by becoming shallow learners. That's how you survive a content-intensive curriculum. You become a shallow learner. And then we say, well, we need academic development at the honors level. Rather strange. Those are your students. Now you need academic, level at post, academic development at postgraduate level as well. But the idea that the, 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 the competencies move gen within each column towards the right uh, as you go down is exactly what it means to develop a coherent competency-based curriculum. I'm interested, and Fazila is working on this, in what data do we need to make sure that we're achieving the competencies that we're expecting? Because writing exams is not a sufficient answer for me. And so we need, we need more data to actually appreciate what it is that we're doing and are we getting it right. I, we don't expect that in the short term we'll be offering PhDs um, uh, or master's degrees at, at our universities. But I think a marker of our success will be the extent to which other good universities in South Africa and in the world are keen to receive our undergraduates as their postgraduate students. Uh, that for me will be a, a serious marker of success. We spent a little bit ti of time on this yesterday and there was a bit of a debate, but I, I do want to engage with this because I think we must get over this uh, um, continual argument of our students fail because they can't speak English properly. Um, I'm not a linguist and I'm not an English major, but I, I, I do think that that's a flawed argument. Uh, I think this, this, uh, this, this habit of thinking that it's about English is, is, is a problem. I believe that if I set my exam in Isizulu and ask the students to respond in Isizulu, they'll probably still fail. And the reason for that is because they haven't engaged with the discourse of knowledge, with the ability to externalize ideas using words. Because the, the argument around English is not able to explain the Southeast Asian students who leave, never having spoken English, go to Imperial College or the top university in the US, end up being top of, top of the class, probably in first year. Because it's, and, and for me, it's about the lack of creative writing in African languages. That for me is central to how you learn, the, that's where you learn how to externalize ideas using words. And it's because our students don't read creative writing in their home languages 
that actually they're not able to respond correctly. But there's also another part of the problem. Academics don't know how to read resp the responses from students. Very often the answers are there, but it's not said in the, in the pro praise or the turn of the prose or the turn of phrase that you like, so therefore it's not correct. In other words, the only way of knowing is as I know. And if you don't know like I know, then you definitely don't know and you deserve to be failed. Um, and I, I really think we need to challenge these notions that it is about English um, or the, the media, language of instruction. Let me also say on that subject while the debate is going on and since the Vice Chancellor is here, I think it's arrogant to imagine that one, one component of the community happen to be calling themselves Afrikaners can think of themselves as the custodian of the Afrikaans language. It's not their business. Uh, I, spoke Afri I grew up speaking Afrikaans to my mother and they can certainly not be the custodians of my Afrikaans. Um, let's have that debate separately. <laughs> Also, I mean, I, I really think that this is something we, we have to consider and we have to consider it seriously. The reality is that the, you must accept the possibility that one of the reasons that your students are failing is because you don't teach them properly. You, you have to accept that as a possibility. And that means that you must continuously be reassessing your teaching habits and methodologies and approaches. And, and an academic who is not doing that is probably, I would argue, it is that, that such an attitude is unbecoming of someone claiming the title academic. Uh, because if you're not willing to consider the possibility that one of the reasons your students are failing is that you're not teaching them properly, then I don't think you should actually be standing in front of a class and teaching. Um, I want to spend just the last few minutes on, on, on the second curriculum issues. This is, this is what I, I call the second curriculum. This is the learning that takes place at the university, but not in the formal engagement. Um, uh, the stuff that makes civil engineers end up reading Trotsky while they're at university. Um, um, it is influenced by the institutional culture, and, and I often say to undergraduate students, choose your university on the basis of the institutional culture. Uh, there's very little difference in what's going to happen in the classroom. I also want to emphasize the point, as I've said before, Passing your exams doesn't necessarily make you a graduate. There are values and attributes that are more than what you would simply get out of exams. Uh, so the institutional culture is very, very important. But what is, what is important here is that it can be directed. The senior leadership of the university can actually direct the institutional culture. And, and, and probably that's what institutional forum was meant to do, if we get it right. Um, I've, I've, uh, I've shown some of this data before. This was an experience that I had at Wits University with the residences. One of the problems with the residences is suddenly at Wits, our residences became entirely black. They went from entirely white to over a very short period entirely black because the need was there. So as soon as black students were allowed to live in the city, um, the residence became entirely black. What happened was the, the academic culture, the residences then went out the door. So the old habit of the guest lecture in residence, the mentoring, etc., whereas academics used to be um, residence coordinators, when it became entirely black, it was mostly administrative staff because the academics didn't want to go there anymore. Um, so we ended up with a situation where more students, you had a higher probability of failing if you lived in residence than if you were a, a, a day student, which of course is, is perverse, it sounds perverse, but that was the reality. Um, I, got, I became DVC in 2006 and we started engaging with the problem and we started taking intervention. What we did was we said for first years compulsory homework on a Sunday evening after the, for the first semester. It was only compulsory for the first semester. Uh, I got whole uh, students in uh, residence um, committees to organize guest lectures occasionally. Uh, if students were listening to rap music, well, why do they call women bitches and what does it mean? Um, and so students were engaging with ideas, but what was important was we kept tutorials out of the residence. I said, this is not an extension of the classroom. This is not a place for tutorials. This is developing the habits of mind that make for successful learners. And that's really all we did. What we noticed was that even when it was not compulsory, first year students continued to attend. Students not in residence but living in private residences in Bromfontein were also attending. We, we paid uh, senior students a small stipend out of teaching development grant 
to sit in the room while the students were doing the homework. So if you put up your hand, there'd be somebody who could maybe not answer your question, but point you towards the right answer. The senior students would themselves be doing their own homework, uh, but they just happened to be in the room. And we, pay, we made sure we checked who was attending. But then we, then we looked at, we monitored individual courses, and I just wanted to show you, this is accounting, economics. Um, so the red is day students, and blue is uh, resident students. And I'm plotting course pass rate. Number of students who pass a course divided by the number of students who were registered for the course. And I do an average for a particular cohort. Uh, you can see in the, it starts at 2002, goes to 2011. Resident students slowly starting to, to, to look better. We had very big improvement in the mathematics courses. So the applied maths and mathematics courses look suddenly just was doing very well. As you can see in the early years, residents, uh, uh, the, the day students uh, on occasion were doing better than resident students. What was remarkable for, um, for the, uh, this, what this shows, sorry, I, I wanted to point to you that sudden dip in 2009 is the first year of the NSC. Remember the first NSC was 2008. We, the university didn't know what they were doing and how to interpret NSC. So the first group of students in 2009 were, we showed, at Wits showed up very high uh, failure rates. I think it was a national issue, uh, but that, that's that peak that you see, uh, that dip that you see there. What was remarkable, the only class differentiator we could find was, uh, we could use was NISFES or non-NISFES. Uh, and so this shows NISFES students in residence, NISFES students not in residence. For those in residence, you see no dip in 2009. There's no spike in 2009, which I found quite remarkable. In other words, if you look after them and if you so support them properly, they actually don't do, uh, they perform reasonably well. Um, this is all the residences at WITS. Um, the blue line is the worst one in 2002. Uh, had an 18% course pass rate, which means that on average a student was passing one out of five courses. Uh, by 2011, we, they were up at just over 75% course pass rate. Uh, the black line shows the average of all the WITS residences, and you can see an improvement there. And that was simply in dealing with the habits of mind that make for good uh, students, not necessarily classroom activity. Um, let me stop there. We've run, I've run out of time, but let me stop there and say thank you very much. I don't know if there are any questions or comments. Thank you. Thank you. This, this. Thank you, uh, Professor Balim. We let's let's continue the argument again. Eh? The one on language. That, yes. My name is Kuzineto Jimbo, and I'm the DVC teaching and research at, at the Valley University of Technology. So let, let's continue the debate. I think I agree with you on some of the comments you've made on language. But I think we need to do more research to really understand why language, especially L1 or the, you know, the local language that students speak at home, is, is important for us to introduce as universities and, and indeed as a nation. Because the, the way we normally dismiss the role of language in teaching and learning and especially with relation to what I talked about the other day in terms of, um, I think it was talked about this morning, epistemological access, cognitive dissonance. I, I take, I take your, your argument about East Asian students, whether they go to the US or to the UK, they excel. But I think we need to do more research, especially in our own context. And one of the things that you didn't mention about language, which most of us are concerned with, is that at the macro national level, we really need a policy that addresses the issue of language. 
so that their supportive infrastructures, finances, etc., that support initiatives within the university or within the South African Academy in terms of introducing a local language. There is research, and if you Google, you'll find it, there is research in some of our institutions that show that, especially in mathematics, for instance, that students who learn or study mathematics in their L1, they perform better on average than students who study and learn in mathematics using a second language. Thank you. And I also just want to add, Eunice, that this is it's, 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 it's both a political and an, and an ideological issue, the whole issue of language. I don't think we can abstract it from, from our political and ideological context. Thanks. I, I mean, I agree. I'm not going to be long. Uh, I, I agree. I think more research is required. However, I do want to make a point about, you've even used the, the, the phrase epistemological access. I think the phrase is meaningless. Epistemological access is a meaningless phrase. But if you do give it meaning, that it, then it is arrogant. It assumes that you need access to my epistemology, uh, which is, of course, nonsense. Uh, epistemic values makes more sense. To speak of epistemic values makes more sense. Because just take the phrase you've used, epistemological access assumes that you arrive without an epistemology, which is nonsense. Everybody, can, everybody gives meaning to the observable universe, and that's called epistemology. Um, when the, the Greeks and the, the Romans were adding enormous value to mathematics, law, and philosophy, they were doing this at a time when they believed that lightning was caused by argumentative gods. That was the epistemology of the time. There's nothing wrong. It, it may have been flawed, but that was how people understood the world. So I, I do think... I do think there's, a, there's, there's an issue about the way in which people engage with the discourse of knowledge. It's not, that's what I'm arguing, it's not really language. It's about the discourse of knowledge. My Afrikaans writing improves when I read uh, Afrikaans novels. Um, and it happens all the time. If I neglect my Afrikaans reading, I don't write Afrikaans well. So it's, it's something that our students have to get on top of, yeah. That's me. Um, I'm Chrissy Bowie, DVC at Rhodes University. Help me, Chrissy, with this language issue. Um, <laughs> I'm going to try to. There is a very, very, very long history of language research in this country. I mean, my work has been focused there. I, I can name many, many others. Cecilia Jacobs, Lucia Thiessen, Morag Paxton, lots of people at UCT. Um, and all that work has been located in a perspective in critical social science. So we've looked at language from an ideological perspective using critical social and learning theories. And what all that research shows is that the way we construct the language problem in this country is problematic. Mm -hmm. So the work has deconstructed the common sense constructions but the problem is that nobody reads the work. And we go on <laughs> repeating the same old stories about language. If there's an appeal that can be made, it's the appeal to please read that work. I've reviewed it in a number of documents, including a review that went right back to the 1980s, which was for the um, HSRC. It's a piece of work often called Lessons Learned. Now, the lessons that we were learning in the 1980s what we can see them, we haven't learned them. We're still, we're still doing the things that we learned not to do <laughs> from that work. So yes, it's an appeal. And it goes back to what I said yesterday in the workshop, that wh when you look at data, that it's just symbols on a, a screen or on a page. You have to make sense of it. And you have to bring a theoretical lens to make sense of it. So those theoretical lens have been developed in this country particularly around the language story. And I'd really encourage, plead with people to go back and look at the work that's been done. Thank you. That's your, no, that's fine. Adam? So, um, so what I wanted to say is, I mean, I wanted to come back to the Sol Pleike experience because I do think that the Sol Pleike experience uh, holds a lot of lessons for how we could move forward. And I thought that you touched on it right in your first slide you demonstrated the success and then you pushed it aside. 
And I want to go back to that. Because what it did say, it showed very powerfully, is that if you can get, and yes, obviously, getting good learning practices, getting reading cultures going, getting a more coherent uh, teaching program, uh, looking at pedagogy, getting academics to look at all of the kinds of issues and be willing to understand that their teaching is also plays a role. All of that is important. But the real success, it seems to me, of Salt Lake is the following. It's dealt with the real problems that students have. It's dealt with food, it's got small classes, it's got good teachers, it's got good supervision, and it's monitoring it on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. If you look at our history for the last 20 years, we've done exactly the opposite. We've expanded the system, and I don't mind that, but we've not only expanded the system, we've made our institutions bigger, we've made our classes bigger, we've done exactly all of the opposite things. That's all plaiki. So you look at the US example. It's got 5,000 institutions. But it doesn't have institutions with 500,000 people. It's got small institutions. So, and they focus on it. It's got some big universities. But it goes on small classes, small institutions, small success stories. Mm -hmm. And it's the accumulation of the small success stories. And so I want to come back to that because if we're going to speak systemically, Unless you get to the real problems, you don't resolve. If your students are starving, you can have the most coherent uh, academic program in the world. You can have the best lecturers. They're not going to learn because they starve. And that's what we've got to get to. And Absolutely. it seems to me that that's a systemic question. And that's the lesson that comes out of so like So what I would hate is for you to become a 10, 15,000 institution. I'd rather you'll be a 3,000 institution with 90% success rate. Mm -hmm. Because that then provides a systemic lesson. And you're taking 3,000 people from poor communities. You're achieving a class mobility project that no institution has achieved. And that's important for inclusive development. Yeah, Thank you, Arun. That's enough. <laughs> I'm going to take that as applause for Salt Lake University, not for Adam. <laughs> 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 but thank you, Adam. That was useful. Thank you. And Prof. Half is still around, so he's not disappearing, so we can ask him questions over here.